And now, without further delay, let's begin today's event, sponsored by CoStar and hosted by Accounting Today. I would like to introduce our moderator, and that is Dan Hood. Dan, you have the floor. Thank you, Adam, and thank you all for joining us today. Let's, uh, let's move on. I want to introduce our, our presenters. Uh, first up, we've got Matt Waters. He's a CPA and director of lease accounting with CoStar. Uh, he's got a lot of background in, uh, as a lease accounting manager with Home Depot and American Tower with 15 years of experience. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. And also with us is Tim Colbert. He's a managing director at Deloitte & Touche, and he's got uh, close to 20 years of experience in, in accounting, uh, and he's one of their leading experts on lease accounting. So, Tim, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Dan. And with that, Matt? I turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, and nice to talk with you again. And Tim, I just want to say thank you uh, as well to you right up front for joining us today. Always a pleasure to uh, to talk with you and and go through lease accounting content together. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, really day two for lease accounting. So. Uh, what I mean by day two is after the initial adoption of ASC 842. And, um, and, and then really, we're going to dive into these 10 topics that you see on your screen right now. And I'm not going to read them off of this slide, uh, but just to, to let you know where we're going, we're going to talk about each one of these. And uh, we, we um, accumulated this list from uh, our experience at CoStar. And at CoStar, we have a lease administration, lease accounting application, uh, and we have hundreds of customers uh, that have gone live in the past several years uh, for the purpose of, of achieving ASC 842 compliance. Um, many of those were public companies because uh, the public company deadline uh, was a few years ago. And, um, and since that time, we've actually had more public companies uh, come online with CoStar, and um, and it's not that uh, that they were handling lease accounting manually before that. It's that they selected a different software, um, and then now they're coming to, to CoStar uh, within the first two years of using the software and looking to replace uh, the the software that they chose with CoStar. So we we really started you know looking into that. We're glad we could help these companies, but we. We started to want to understand well why are companies switching over to CoStar um, in such a short amount of time? You know, nobody wants to do two software implementations in that short amount of time. And uh, and really this this list emerged uh, from from those discussions as, as far as what large companies want and need from a from a lease administration and lease accounting software. Um, and and we realized that, um, that, that from that discovery, uh, really, uh, it could be framed up as a list of best practices. Um, so that's what we're going to present today. And again, we'll go through these, um, these one by one and, and give you some information that hopefully you can take back and, and use at your organization. Uh, Tim, I'd like to hand it over to you for your opening remarks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Matt. And, and I'm really excited to be talking with Matt today and, and fostering a dialogue on the, test, the 10 best practices for day two and beyond. Uh, but there's one other point I want to highlight. And before I even get to that point, I do want to set the stage. The initial focus by most organizations was day one compliance. So the focus was on implementing ASC 842 or IFRS 16. In many cases, the day two considerations was really really an afterthought. And this is where I want to put my auditor's hat on for a moment. It's important for every company to ensure that there are controls and processes in place to allow for continued success in monitoring, maintaining, and reporting on lease accounting. You'll see that the 10 best practices that we'll be discussing today are primarily system driven. Equally as important are developing processes and procedures that will deal with capturing new leases, reflecting changes to existing leases, applying the accounting requirements, and ultimately presenting and disclosing the amounts related to the leases in the financial statements. Some of those activities definitely rely on systems and, and processes that are technology-based, and, and we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit today. But in some scenarios, you'll have to come up with manual processes and controls. And if you can document those processes and demonstrate to your auditors that they're in place, it'll make your, your implementation successful on a go-forward basis. 
that's all I have to say, Matt. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Great. Thank you, Tim. And Dan, I think that brings up our first polling question. It does indeed. Uh, and here we're asking, which best describes your company and status for ASC 842 or IFRS 16, <clears throat> the lease accounting transition? Are you a non-public company that's working on the transition? Are you a non-public company that's already transitioned? Are you a public company that's already transitioned? Are you a public company that's already transitioned, but you're looking to make improvements? That's the day two aspect we're talking about here. Or uh, something else not applicable, maybe with an accounting firm or or something else either way. Uh, the way this works is you click the radio button to the left of the answer you're looking for uh, that works best for you. Then you go to the right to hit submit to make sure it gets registered for credit. Um, I'm going to leave this poll up a little longer than some of the later ones for those of you who are unfamiliar with the platform because, uh, as we mentioned, you do need to answer all the polling questions uh, to get CPE credit. So uh, go ahead and tell us which uh, which best describes your company in, in terms of uh, the lease accounting transition. You're non-public and working on it non-public and you've already done it, public and already done it, public and you've already done it, but you could make improvements or, or some other uh, some other relation to ASC. If you're standing aside and looking at ASC in terror and fear, that's uh, that could probably go under other if you like. Um, I should mention that we are, uh, we're asking you questions now, but we're to take, take your questions in the Q&A panel uh, on your screen there. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can at the, uh, at the end of the session or if some of them are appropriate while we're going on, we may get to them then. But either way, you can put those in and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, by the end of the, the session. For the moment, though, uh, we're asking you which best describes your company and status for ASC 842 or, or IFRS, IFRS sorry, 16, uh, if that's what applies to you. Again, non-public working on it, non-public already done it, public company already done it, public company already done it, but looking and saying, hmm, we could do better, uh, <laughs> or other not applicable. Again, click the radio button to the left of the answer that works for you go to the right and click submit to make sure it gets registered. If you're not seeing this polling question, that sometimes happens every once in a while, click uh, refresh your browser. That'll usually pop it up to the front. If that doesn't, you can take your browser off full screen mode. That sometimes allows it to pop up too. Uh, so either way, uh, if you haven't had a chance to answer, please do so now because I'm going to close this poll up. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. So I'm going to uh, wrap this up in about five seconds. If you haven't had a chance to tell us which should best describes your company, please do so now. Click the radio button to the left of the answer. Go to the right and hit submit to close it up and do that in the next five seconds and i'll count you down five four three two one and let's see uh let's see who's in the audience here non-public working on the transition uh, a little over two-fifths uh and tied for that is other not applicable not many non-public companies that have already transitioned not many public companies that have transitioned and not many public companies looking to make improvements mainly people who haven't made the transition or, or something else entirely with that man i'll hand it back to you all right, thank you, Dan. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, that's actually a, a good amount of participation from non-public companies, uh, which you know isn't surprising, I guess, where um, where we are in the timeline and um, and the deadline looming for for those companies. So uh, happy that that everyone is with us today. Hopefully, we'll give you something uh, that that everybody can use. Um, so the first point we're going to talk about is integrate the lease accounting system with an ERP system. And so, you know, this, this is, um, you know, I'd say vitally important to most companies, although some did not do this from the beginning of ASC 842. Um, you know, and, and as Tim mentioned up front, you know, we were uh, in, in many ways just uh, early on getting used to the idea of, uh, of ASC 842. And, and so companies were, were just simply focused on the initial compliance event um, and they say, well, you know, let's just make sure our balance sheet is correct um, from the beginning, and um, and then we'll figure out the efficiencies later. Uh, when they got to later, you know, which, which we're calling day two, uh, they said, wow, you know, we we need to integrate uh, these monthly entries uh, with with an automatic uh, integration, um, you know, because some some decided to just upload entries or, or some systems. Uh, did not even have the capability of, of integrating. And so, you know, companies would have to have their accountants download journal entries um, from their lease accounting system, format them in a particular way, you know, with cost centers and uh, in the entire GL string that they need, and then upload that into the ERP system. Uh, well, of course, that, that gets old month after month. Uh, so the first one we're talking about here is the best practice is simply integrate the journal entries um, into your ERP system. Of course, CoStar can, can 
um, accommodate that, um, even including allocations um, and you know, some of the more complex GL strings that, uh, that large companies have. Tim, over to you for your thoughts on this one. So from the standpoint of my experience, one observation I have in dealing with, with some of our clients, and this is both from the advisory and the audit side of the house, is there are systems and processes that they have in place that really have manual intervention required. The inherent value of having an ERP system connected with the lease accounting system is the removal of this manual intervention. It allows for efficiency. It allows for the completeness of the data. By removing manual intervention, it allows for the information to be much more accurate, and it, it saves, saves times and minimizes mistakes. So that is some of the inherent benefits that I've seen by this approach. Thank you, Tim. And just to, to give a few visuals on this one, um, Really, the journal entries is just one aspect of integration. Uh, there are many, many modules uh, in the ERP system and even systems outside uh, of the traditional ERP that can be integrated with a lease accounting system. Uh, so things like uh, FX rates, uh, vendor master data, um, discount rates we'll talk about a little bit later, um, even, even into um, the AP processing of rent, uh, AR processing, and, uh, and of course, finally, financial reporting, uh, even including um, integrating with an account reconciliation software uh, to, to auto-certify reconciliation. So, so really, the journal entries is, is just the, the tip of the iceberg as far as integrations, um, and, and CoStar can help you with all of these items. Um, just a, a quick splash of logos here of, of some of the more common ERP systems and, and other um, financial software that we have integrated with. Uh, I should say this is not an all-inclusive list. Um, this is just uh, the logos we thought we, we could fit on the screen uh, meaningfully, but, um, you know, so you can still read them, but, um, but we've integrated with, uh, with every ERP system that I've ever heard of and some that I uh, that I had never heard of until we integrated with them. So, you know, uh, rest assured that, that we'll be able to integrate um, with your ERP system um, if you decide to go down that path. Now, the next point we'll talk about is uh, implement one seamless solution for lease accounting and lease administration. So, uh, what this means is, uh, of course, with every lease you have uh, the, the terms of the agreement. And those terms are typically abstracted into a lease administration system. Um, if for nothing else, just to make sure um, that, uh, that for real estate, for example, the landlord gets paid on time. Um, you know, so, so most companies use a system for that. It, um, it generally links with their, their AP software and, um, and the payments are made on time. So, so that's, that's the lease administration side at a very basic level. Um, and um, and the, the core of that is the lease abstract, uh, the, the uh, data that's entered into that system. Uh, now, that same data, you know, really, um, you know, simply speaking, the, the dates of the agreement, the dollars that are associated with the lease, and then the option terms, um, specifically the options that are reasonably certain, uh, they need to be tracked not only for lease administration, but also for lease accounting. And uh, that, that data becomes the really the backbone of the ASC 842 accounting calculations. Um, and so if the two systems are not related or linked together, um, the lease administration team ends up typing in a lease abstract, entering all that data, and then emailing it to the lease accounting team um, and then the lease accounting team has to enter it all over again into a separate lease accounting solution. So that's not ideal. Uh, the best practice is to use a system uh, that has seamless lease administration and lease accounting workflows so that when the lease administration team uh, enters new information uh, for a new lease, 
or revises information on, on an existing lease, uh, that information automatically flows over into uh, the accounting team's workflow and is available there for calculations. Um, now, I think it's also important to point out that um, the accounting team doesn't want to know about every change that a lease administration team makes. For example, if they change the landlord's phone number, accounting doesn't need to know about that. Um, I know I've, I've been in a situation before uh, a long time ago with a with another company, a different software, that I, I was a lease accounting manager and I did receive notifications anytime the lease administration team opened a lease, right? They, they might have changed the address or changed the phone number of the landlord or, or typed in a note that they spoke to the landlord on Tuesday and, and it would alert me every single time. And of course, what that did was made me completely ignore all alerts from my system. So what we've done at CoStar is we've, we've narrowed that down uh, to the point that accounting only gets alerted when the lease administration team makes a change that applies to accounting. Uh, and so then, the, of course, the alerts are meaningful and, um, and accountants pay attention to those. Um, and, and getting those throughout the month actually uh, really helps speed up the month and close process too. Jim, over to you. Thanks a lot, Matt. And I, I just want to make a couple of observations here. And I know we mentioned this on the last slide, that the primary focus of most organizations was initially meeting the compliance requirements of either ASC 842 or IFRS 16. Now, due to the voluminous data that is required uh, to measure the lease and due to the fact that companies needed that information and put it needed to put that information in the system to, to manage the leases. One thing that has been abundantly made clear is companies have now realized the benefits of having this information outside of just using it to meet the compliance requirements of 842 and I for us 16. We've seen many organizations, I don't want to say turn on or flip the switches on their accounting software to, to allow for lease administration, but effectively that is what's happened. Many organizations are realizing the inherent benefits about having a lease administration tool because they can use it for budgeting and forecasting purposes. They can use it for other management reporting and ultimately holistically look at their lease population from the standpoint of their business and their operations. That is a benefit that's well beyond just having and meeting the compliance requirements under the accounting standards. They're using all of the capabilities of their application in order to help better manage their business, their real estate and equipment lease portfolio, et cetera. So I lack of a better uh, way of putting it, I agree with everything that Matt said that there are definite benefits about having a combined lease accounting and lease administration solution. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. And th this next slide is, is just uh, uh, the same graphic we looked at um, in the last topic, but I've highlighted here that uh, in the middle section, lease accounting, lease administration are, are joined together. Uh, so uh, not in a separate system, no double work. Um, and, you know, we won't spend any time on this today, but it's important to point out that uh, you can also have project management, uh, transaction management, uh, and workflows tracked all in the same system as well. So, um, so as, as much of this as you can have under one umbrella, um, and um, and still have, have meaningful um, reporting and, and accurate results. Um, you know, I'd say the better. So, the next topic: automate lease remeasurements. So, uh, remeasurements squarely in, in day two territory. And, and what a remeasurement is under lease accounting is basically when something changes on a lease and you have to remeasure the accounting schedule for ASC 842. Um, so examples of this would be a termination of the lease, a renewal of the lease. Um, you can have impairment uh, because the right of use asset um, under lease accounting rules is, is subject to impairment testing. Um, you can even have a partial termination, something that we've seen come up uh, more and more recently with, um, with the, the COVID environment. Um, you know, companies are reevaluating office space in particular. Uh, retailers are, are evaluating their, their retail footprints. 
Um, so partial terminations have, have become something that companies look at quite frequently, um, you know, just to right size their, their real estate portfolio. Uh, but all of these different uh, remeasurement events uh, have specific accounting treatment associated with them. Um, and then when you remeasure, uh, there, there's typically a change to the right of use asset and the lease liability. Um, the, um, there, there can be a gain or a loss associated with that. And, uh, and then there's also a go, go forward impact on the amortization schedule. And, uh, and so these are, are really tedious to, to tackle manually. Um, so having a software in place that uh, automatically calculates what you need for remeasurements is, is really key. And, um, and again, we, we see a lot of companies switching over to CoStar uh, to pick up this functionality. Tim, over to you. Thanks, Matt. And, and I really agree with all of Matt's points that he made here. Automating lease remeasurements does reduce time, it improves efficiency, and will likely eliminate the need for manual calculations. And whenever you can do anything in a systematic way, that also removes the potential for error. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't point out the importance of understanding the ASC 842 and IFRS 16 lease modification framework and how it's to be applied for company specific transactions. It's definitely great to have a tool that will automate the remeasurement calculations, but the starting point is always understanding how the modification model works in the context of a specific transaction. For example, understanding the unit of account that is impacted by the remeasurement event, for instance, and cha a change in the term of one floor of a building will likely result in the need to reassess and remeasure all of the building's uh, floors in the building, irrespective of whether the floor was accounted for on a combined basis or separately in the system. It's also important to understand the implications of certain types of changes, certain types of assumptions, et cetera. Matt made reference to termination of leases. So understanding how the termination penalty should be accounted for for your specific transaction is key because there's a wholesale difference between accounting for a termination penalty when it is the only lease component that's being terminated versus accounting for a termination penalty when there will be surviving lease components. So in addition to having a, a system or application that can do remeasurement on an automated basis, I would strongly encourage you to understand the accounting requirements so you can holistically understand the best way to remeasure your leases on a go-forward basis. That's all I have, Matt, on this one. Great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, that's an excellent advice there, um, no doubt. Uh, and I imagine the same advice will apply to our next topic here, uh, which is very similar, but uh, this one's automate retrospective true-ups. So uh, what I mean by retrospective true-ups is, uh, is really a common scenario in accounting. Um, I'm sure everyone who has who's ever worked in a uh, corporate accounting department uh, knows the feeling when you've uh, already closed the books, uh, maybe you're even working through the, the next month's close, and you get late information. So uh, you should have had that information uh, during the previous month. Um, it didn't come in on time for, for a, you know, a variety of reasons. Uh, but now you're in a position where you're having to evaluate, well, is, is this material? You know, should we reopen that prior period and, and make the correction? Now, if it crossed, uh, uh, you know, a fiscal quarter or a, or a fiscal year end, uh, of course, the, the discussion there is, um, is, is even more urgent. Um, but, um, but what we've done at CoStar is we've, we've automated retrospective true-ups uh, you know, and, and you, you're able to use your judgment on this. So if, um, if information comes in late, it's not material enough to open up a prior period, uh, CoStar has automated the process of uh, comparing what should have been booked in the prior period uh, to what was actually booked, and then posting an automatic true-up entry in the next open period. Um, so for, for correcting those, um, those small um, items that come in after a month in close, we found this to be really convenient for our customers. And, um, but, you know, again, and, um, and, and I think Tim raised a really good point. You know, you have to understand 
um, your accounting policies around um, around when to use this. Tim, uh, what do you think about that? And again, this is where I'm going to put my auditor's hat in on. The reality of the matter here is what we're talking about are leases that should have been reported in the prior period in many cases. And I, I really agree that in practice, there are likely instances where an existing lease or new leases often don't make their way to accounting in a timely manner. Therefore, the prior period's already closed. You have to, to address how you get those in a system at, at this point in time. So I can see some inherent benefits of having a leases tool that allow for a automated true up of what the accounting should have been in the past. That, that does have its advantages. But this really doesn't negate the fact that companies will ultimately need to evaluate the significance of these types of true ups for the purposes of determining whether the prior period was materially impacted. That said, I would strongly encourage anyone that's faced in this to these scenarios to get your auditors on board so they understand what the financial reporting implications are, as well as what the, the dollars are that, that may be in the wrong period. When it comes to controls and processes, if you have a control and process in place that identifies these types of issues, that your auditors know that, that you've caught it and, and you're assessing from the materiality perspective, that'll go a long way to building that relationship with your auditor and ensuring them that you have the right controls and processes in place. But again, as Matt mentioned, this is something that is, is fairly common. It's just a matter of you can't overlook the fact that you really need to, to make sure that it's not something that materially was omitted from prior financial reporting periods. Back over to you, Matt. Thank you, Tim. And um, and once again, excellent advice there. And the next slide is just um, a bit of a screenshot, you know, as far as how this works in the system. Um, and, and it really can apply to any type of remeasurement. Um, and, and then what you see here is what I described earlier, the original schedule, the remeasured schedule, you know, basically what what should have been is the remeasured schedule compared to the original schedule. And then the retro schedule just takes the difference of the two and, and books the difference in the, the next open period, uh, which in this case uh, was April. So on to our next topic. Uh, this one is systematically control policy compliance and data quality. Um, so what we're talking about here is, um, is really uh, functionality from the software uh, to help you sleep at night. You know, uh, there, a lot of data goes into a lease accounting application. And uh, really, there's, there's two main ways that the data gets, um, gets into the system. Uh, you have what we'll call a manual entry, which is, um, you know, an accountant uh, at their workstation entering information, you know, testing leases and, um, and, and setting up amortization schedules. You know, it's a it's a really easy process um, in the software, um, but uh, but that's the you know kind of the, the keystrokes version um, you know that you see, and then uh, the other way information gets into the software is through bulk uploads, and uh, the bulk upload process is is just what it sounds like. You you have a template that you fill out, um, you upload that into the software. And it, it adds a bunch of schedules all at one time. You know, so this is really efficient for, um, for initial adoption. You know, if you're trying to, to set up all of your ASC 42 accounting schedules at one time, uh, you, will, you will most likely use the bulk upload tool. Um, and, um, and then, you know, on a go forward basis, you might use the bulk upload tool um, if, you, if you execute a um, you know, a large group of leases at once, maybe for equipment or something like that, uh, or if you acquire another company, uh, plenty of uses really for, for bulk upload. But in, in either case, what, uh, what CoStar has done is developed a system of, of basically uh, checks. So the system will automatically check um, the, the data that's entered, whether you've entered it uh, on your workstation or, or whether you've uploaded it in bulk, CoStar uh, will automatically check the data 
uh, based on hundreds of criteria uh, to make sure that, um, that it meets uh, standards. And the standards can be as simple as, um, as the right format, right? So if you, if you were one column off in your upload, for example, and you tried to import a date into a field that, uh, that is financial, you know, should have dollars in it, uh, the system will, will reject that line of your upload and, um, and give you a, a message letting you know that you need to revisit that. Um, now, something to point out there is that uh, at CoStar, we don't reject the entire file. Uh, you know, and, and make you hunt and search for which line was the error, right? We, we just reject the line that was an error um, or, and, and multiple lines if necessary. But if you have, um, you know, let's say you had 100 lines that were, that were perfect and only one was wrong, you only have to, to, uh, to address the one. Um, now, on the, um, on the accounting side, you know, that was a, a really simple example, you know, a date and a dollar field. Uh, but we actually take this uh, into the accounting policy realm too, and um, and uh, for example, if a, a user has tested and determined that a lease is an operating lease, they flagged it as such in the system. Uh, but they've also uh, notated and documented in the lease that there's a transfer of ownership. Uh, well, CoStar is going to alert the user that uh, that we think it's a finance lease. We're not going to force your hand. You know, you, might, you may have a good reason for that, uh, or there may be something you need to correct. Uh, but we will alert the user uh, with a pop-up. Uh, an alert will also show up anytime you, you log into the amortization schedule. Um, you can type a note to, to explain, uh, you know, why there's an exception on that schedule. Uh, and uh, managers are like this. You can actually run a report that tells you all of the alerts outstanding for your entire portfolio, uh, so you can go in and check and um, and just understand um, what alerts have users have seen, um, that, uh, whether or not they've been overridden, and um, and any comments that have been typed in. So really, uh, turns out to be a, a robust system. Again, hundreds of of checks that are automatically being performed. Um, behind the scenes. Uh, Tim, let me turn it over to you. When when you think about the nature of what your auditors would expect, they would expect there to be controls in place to ensure that the, the information that, that they're auditing is accurate. You have manual controls and you have automated controls. From the standpoint of, of automated controls that go through the data and scrub the data to look for fields that would be expected and are not there, or certain conclusions, like Matt just talked about, lease classification that should be X, but they have is Y, and, and it flags that, that, that's absolutely a good attribute to, to have whether it be CoStar or any other accounting, lease accounting solution out there, if there's something that can help be the rumble strips in the road to ensure that the data is as, as complete and accurate as possible, that is, is definitely a plus. From the audit perspective, I can see that making auditing the information a lot easier. And once we get comfortable with the controls that are in place in the system itself, that will help dictate the nature and extent of the procedures. And having that automatic systematic functionality is it's it's really good for in my personal view. Great. Thank you, Tim. And the next couple slides I'll just run through really fast. You know, this is mainly examples uh, for you guys to take home with you, but um, just a, a few screenshots of, of a successfully validated uh, import file. And, um, and then an example of, of some workflow and controls set up in the, in the software uh, that can be configured. So moving right along to our next topic, uh, which is automate reports needed for disclosures and auditors. Um, so really the, the two reports that I'll talk about here, although uh, CoStar has dozens of standard reports um, that we make available, uh, to all of our customers. Uh, the two that, that really get kicked around a lot in, um, in AFC 842 discussions 
uh, are the disclosure report and the roll forward report. And the disclosure report is is quite a bit more robust uh, than it used to be. Uh, this is what you need for your lease footnote. Um, you know, it's, it's required for for U.S. GAAP accounting for public and non-public companies. And um, and the footnote requirements, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly, but I, I'd say they probably increased by uh, you know in volume by a factor of, of five or six. You know, what used to be a um, you know maybe a, a quarter of a page uh, has has now turned out to uh, to be um, maybe a page or probably two pages um, on, on most uh, financial statement footnotes. And so having a system in place to automatically calculate those disclosures um, is really vital. And, um, and that's one of the main things that, that motivates a lot of companies to select a system. Um, there, some of the calculations are quite complex, you know, like, like weighted average discount rate across your, your lease portfolio uh, and weighted average lease term. You, know, you, you, don't, you don't really want to be doing that um, by hand. And so having a system that can, that can spit that out along with all of the other line items, um, it, it's really key. Um, and, you know, a lot of systems have a disclosure report. Um, what we have found out, though, is that a lot of systems do not provide the detail behind the disclosure report. Uh, matter of fact, we've had some, some frank discussions with, with some audit firms, um, and, and they have said thank you. <laughs> you know, when, when we talked to them at CoStar, you know, uh, they say thank you to GoStar for including the details uh, on a lease by lease level um, behind the the main page of the disclosure report. And so that's that's what you're going to get with GoStar. You'll get a, a summary page, and then you're going to get all the details you need, and you know the details that your auditor needs to be able to support uh, what's on the face of your disclosures um, at a at a lease level, you know, line by line. The next one is a roll forward report. This is something, you know, when I, when I worked at Home Depot, uh, the auditors asked me for this every, you know, every single year, uh, sometimes on a quarterly basis. And a roll forward is, is simply taking the beginning balance, uh, walking the auditor through what changed during the period, uh, and then showing the ending balance. And, um, and so things that can change for lease accounting, of course, would be uh, the, the normal amortization of the, of the schedule for right of use asset and lease liability. Uh, but then any of those remeasurement events like terminations and, and renewals and uh, impairments, all of those remeasurement events uh, need to be called out and, and are components of a roll forward. Uh, so you could literally spend days, you know, for a, for a large lease portfolio, you can spend days as an accountant creating something like this um, using pivot tables and, and B lookups. Um, and I'm sure many of us have, have had that experience. Uh, so for that reason, CoStar has automated that entire process. So you can select a date range in CoStar, uh, run the roll forward report, and uh, the system will, will in you know, seconds, um, spit out the roll forward that, um, that's uh, typically required for an audit. Tim? And to, to reiterate something Matt just said, because it kind of touched uh, uh, touched a chord with me, so to speak, ASC 842 and IFRS 16 has significantly increased the disclosure requirements. If you're a lessee and you have a nice mix of operating and finance leases, there'll be numerous qualitative disclosures and more than 20 different quantitative disclosures that will need to be dealt with on a periodic basis. And understanding the data that makes up these amounts included in the disclosure, that's, that's really critical. Now, if a company has a significant lease portfolio, it's going to be very challenging for them to put these disclosures together manually. It's really a lot of work. If, if there's hundreds of leases, think about putting hundreds of schedules together and, and figuring out the disclosure. And this will be done on a manual basis unless you have a system that, that addresses this. When you think manual, manual equals prone to mistake. So any lease accounting solution that includes an automated report function that generates the disclosure, that will minimize the need for manual intervention 
and o- overall improve the accuracy of the disclosures themselves. Taking it to the next step, from the auditor's perspective, it's nice to have a system spit out a disclosure report, but ultimately the auditor's going to have to in- audit the amounts included in that disclosure. Having the information behind that disclosure, whether it be by on a lease-by-lease basis, et cetera, that will make auditing this information a lot easier. And it'll also give the company itself a comfort level that its disclosure is complete and meets the requirements from, from the ASC 842 and IFRS 16 perspective. So disclosures, in, in, on top of the presentation requirement, the disclosure requirements represent a wholesale change. And anything that can be done to automate that and, and make it easier from the company's perspective, as well as the auditor's perspective, it's a, a well worth outcome of, of that type of a system. Matt, back over to you. Thank you, Tim. And here's just a uh, quick uh, sample of a roll forward. And, uh, you know, it says this is truncated because it actually uh, takes up more real estate than PowerPoint allows. But uh, the roll forward report uh, shows you the opening balance, everything that's changed, and then the ending balance. And it does this for every single lease. Um, CoStar also has, um, as I mentioned, many standard reports. Um, and um, I should mention briefly that uh, that we also have an ad hoc reporting tool where users can literally just drag and drop uh, any field in the system, drag and drop, and create a report. Uh, so uh, while we've tried to, to make a standard report for the most common uh, reports that are required, um, really users can create any report that they need. Um, they can save them. They can, they can email them out. They can schedule reports uh, to run on a, on a calendar. Uh, so really, the, the ad hoc tool has, has proven to be quite useful. Dan, over to you for the next polling question. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. And this is our second polling session for those who are keeping track. Uh, what concerns you most about performing lease accounting under the new ASC 842 and IFRS 16 standards? Is it understanding the how-to details of the new standards, having to perform manual calculations or workarounds? Is it providing lease-level details that are needed by auditors? Uh, is it reporting on all the requested lease data fields? Or is it nothing? You're already a lease accounting rock star. Um, which is totally a legitimate category. And I hope we have a lot of people <laughs> in there. But um, uh, pick the ra- click the radio button, the little round button to the left of the answer that works best for you, uh, and then go to the right and hit click submit to make sure it gets registered for credit. We do have a number of questions in the Q&A panel. We'll take uh, more. We'll try to get to as many as we can uh, at the end of the session. But in the meantime, we're asking you what concerns you most about performing lease accounting under uh, either ASC 842 or IFRS 16. The how-to details of the new standards, uh, having to perform manual calculations or workarounds, providing lease level details needed for auditors, reporting on all the requested lease data fields or nothing, you're already a lease accounting rock star. Um, if you, again, if you're not seeing this, try refreshing uh, your browser. That should usually pop up to the front or taking your browser off uh, full screen mode. <clears throat> we'll often put it up front for you. Uh, and again, because I know we've got a lot more to cover, so if you haven't had a chance to answer, please go ahead and do so now. We'll give you a few more seconds to, uh, to pick your answer. Again, click the radio button to the left of the one that works for you. Then go to the right and hit submit to make sure it gets registered for credit. I know we have a few more people still looking to to, uh, to answer, so I'm going to keep it up for a few more seconds. But do please let us know what concerns you most about performing lease accounting uh, relatively quickly because we're going to close this poll up in uh, a few seconds. Uh, so, again, what concerns you most about it? Is it the how-to details of the new standards? Is it having to perform manual calculations or workarounds? Is it providing lease-level details for auditors, uh, reporting on all the requested lease data fields, or nothing? You're all set. Good to go. Uh, again, click the radio button to the left, click submit. Uh, we're going to close this poll up in about five seconds. If you haven't had a chance to answer, please do so now. Select your answer and then click submit. Make sure it gets registered. And I will uh, count you down because we we'll close this up in about five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And let's see what uh, what concerns people most. Uh, well over half, the, by far the majority, say understanding the how-to details of the new standards. Uh, a little under uh, 20% ha- having to perform manual calculations. Uh, about 15% say uh, nothing, uh, just reporting on all the requested lease data fields. And then 4% are rock stars. That's exciting. I'm glad to have, have you with us. Matt, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dan. And um, we're entering the home stretch here, so uh, don't worry. We're 
we're going to end on time. I know many of you have um, have meetings after this. So, um, and, and I will say that if you have entered a question in the chat, and if we don't have time to get to it, we will follow up with you over email. So, uh, so don't worry if, um, if we don't answer your questions live. But uh, the next topic here is customized reporting with custom uh, company specific fields. So, you know, this, um, this one really is something that a lot of companies um, did not think about originally, you know, companies that have already adopted ACA 42, you know, they didn't really think about needing uh, custom fields uh, because they're complying with a, you know, a standard um, accounting uh, requirement, right? Uh, ASCA 42 it applies to everybody, so one size fits all software uh, should should work just fine, uh, is what they thought. But but really, when it when it came down to um, uh, you know getting past the initial compliance and then um, then, then being efficient on a go forward basis, uh, many companies realized they needed custom fields um, to really to um, to help their day to day operations. Now. A couple of examples of this from my own experience. I worked at a company called American Tower, and American Tower is a cell phone tower company uh, with literally hundreds of thousands of leases. And uh, one of the clauses that we would see in those contracts uh, really pretty frequently would be a, a livestock clause. And, um, and what that means is, you know, cell phone towers are everywhere. You know, a lot of time they're on open land uh, that's owned by a, a farmer. And so the, um, the farmer wanted to be protected in case uh, one of his cows got trapped in the, uh, in the tower enclosure, right? So, you know, it's not something that's super common uh, in, uh, in other industries, but, uh, but it was something that needed to be tracked at a tower company. You know, an another company I worked for, I led the lease accounting team at Home Depot for many years. And Home Depot, uh, some of our stores had an appliance mezzanine. And uh, what that is, is is basically a second level uh, where where customers could could go up the stairs and and shop for appliances, and it, it let the uh, basically it doubled the square footage of the appliance department at the store. Uh, so um, so hopefully you know increase sales in that area. Um, but uh, but a company like Home Depot uh, will want to know the square footage of an of their appliance mezzanine in each store. Uh, so they can track that you know, versus performance. Um, certainly not every company needs that. Um, the last example I'll give here is really uh, something that, that's come up recently you know, with COVID. Restaurant companies um, want to know and, and are, are very keenly interested in how much outdoor seating they have available. Um, and so that's something that, that you know, perhaps they weren't even tracking before um, uh, recently, but now they need to track. So the point of all these examples is just that, you know, it turns out one size does not fit all. Um, and uh, to really get the most out of a system, you need to be able to customize the system to fit your needs. Uh, CoStar, we can add unlimited um, user-defined uh, custom, you know, company-specific fields to the abstract. Uh, so you can track this type of information. And, um, and what we found out is, is a lot of software is not that flexible. Um, so, so we're picking up um, customers that are wanting to switch over to CoStar for that reason. Tim? For interest of time, because I know we're coming to the top of the hour and I have some feedback on the other uh, topics we're going to discuss. The moral of the story is if companies can leverage their lease accounting tool to, for management reporting, That'll help with operational efficiency and effectiveness within the organization. There's, there's lots of benefits of, of having that additional information. So back to you, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Tim. And, um, and, and this is just a representation of that. You know, what we found is, is um, you know, what you can take a, a generic lease solution that's been propped up with a bunch of Excel spreadsheets and, and just get it all into one software. So. Um, so that's the goal here, and, and of course, that's more efficient. The next topic is maintain separate schedules for book tax differences and other areas of accounting. So, um, really, the the main example that I, that I think uh, resonates the most here and is used most often is tenant improvement allowance. Um, tenant improvement allowance 
under ASC 842 um, basically just becomes part of the amortization schedule. Um, if it's received up front, um, it's, it's part of the right of use asset. Um, it, you know, it might be scheduled later in the lease, in which case it can be part of the net present value calculation, uh, which becomes part of the lease liability and the right of use asset. But the point is that under ASC 842, specifically under that area of accounting, um, there's really no need to split out a tenant improvement allowance. It's just part of the amortization schedule. But for tax accounting, it's a book tax difference. And your tax department will probably come around, you know, at least once a year and ask you, hey, what part of your right of use asset is made up of tenant improvement allowance? Um, and so uh, in order to be able to give them that answer, you need to have that uh, on, a, on a schedule that can be split out from the main accounting schedule. And that's what CoStar has created. Um, and this, this really can apply to numerous areas of accounting. Um, but, uh, but Tim, I'll, I'll kick it over to you for your thoughts on this feature. Yeah, and, and this is one of those issues that I view as important. So when you think about from the book perspective, ASC Topic 740 was not amended by the lease accounting standard. So from book perspective, where while the balance sheet may be grossed up with additional assets and liabilities, the net impact would just be the recognition of larger deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. So it's really a mechanical exercise. The sleeper issue, though, is what you highlighted, Matt, and that's from the tax compliance perspective, there may be some challenges. To level set, there really won't be any changes from the lease characterization perspective. So a true lease will under the old requirements will still be a true lease and a finance lease under the old requirements will still be under the new requirements. But it's important to understand what makes up the right of use asset because each of the components of the right of use asset has a distinct uh, accounting from the, the tax perspective. So when you think about some of those discrete items, tenant incentive allowances, prepaid rent, they're gonna be treated differently for tax, whereas these amounts are collapsed in the right of use asset. And really there's no need for visibility of those amounts for book purposes. So it's critical for there to be a way to separately track these amounts that are rolled into the right of use asset. And if the system can do that, that that's a good added benefit. Yeah, thank you, Tim. And um, here's just a a quick take home slide showing you what a, a separate schedule might look like. And rolling right into number nine, uh, matching the incremental borrowing rate to leases automatically. And so basically every lease uh, that gets put on the balance sheet requires an interest rate. And most lessees are using the incremental borrowing rate um, to, to calculate that. And, um, and the, the process of collecting the incremental borrowing rate um, can uh, can be kind of complex. I mean, you can really end up with hundreds of rates to choose from uh, because different uh, leases, uh, let's say you have a five-year lease uh, compared to a 10-year lease, uh, well, those two leases are gonna have uh, probably different incremental borrowing rates. And, and you can imagine how many buckets there could be as you, you get up into 10, 20, 30-year leases. Um, the rate will probably be different for real estate versus equipment leases. It can also vary by geography or currency. Uh, so what we've done in CoStar is we've created a feature to automatically select the incremental borrowing rate for you. Um, somebody maybe on your treasury team uh, would just periodically update your list of rates and then the system would choose it for you. Tim? The only thing I have to say here is when you think about organizations that have hundreds or even thousands of leases, if there is a way to get the discount rate captured and assigned to each of the leases whenever there's a new lease or whenever there is a modified lease, that will ultimately eliminate human intervention, reduce errors, and hopefully make the process efficient and more effective. So back over to you, Matt. All right, thank you. And, um, and there's just a quick screenshot of what that looks like. And I think we have one more polling question and, and then one more point and we'll be done. 
There you go. All right. That's great. We're almost at the top of the hour. What is your biggest challenge with the current lease account with your current lease accounting software or your biggest concern with selecting a new system? Uh, is it uh, lost productivity, performing manual tasks, stress over lack of lease level details for auditors, concern about errors for lease data entry and validation, inability to perform requested reports easily on all lease data or none? Your lease accounting system is bulletproof. It's great. You're a hero. Uh, and your system is fantastic. Um, so, again, if you're not seeing this, please uh, you know, refresh your browser. That will pop to the front or take your browser off uh, full screen mode. That should usually make sure you can see it because uh, we want to do uh, want to get that last point in before the top of the hour. So we're asking everybody to go ahead and tell us what's your biggest challenge with your current lease accounting software or your biggest concern with selecting a new system, uh, whichever of those uh, – Whichever one of those makes best sense to you, click the radio button to the left of them, then go to the right and submit to make sure they get registered. Uh, we have a few more, a uh, uh, few more people still to respond, uh, but they're coming in as we talk, as we speak, um, and then we'll get to that uh, to the last point, and we'll be uh, we'll be good to go. Um, I'm sorry we were not able to able to get into uh, all the questions in the Q and A panel. We'll look to uh, to get to those later, uh, not during today's session, but uh, for now, tell us what the the biggest challenge. With your current lease accounting software, your biggest concern with selecting a new system is lost productivity because of manual tasks and spreadsheets, stress over lack of lease level details for your auditors, concern about errors for lease data entry and validation, inability to perform requested reports uh, uh, easily on all your lease data or none. You're in great shape. Everything's perfect. Click the radio button to the left. It works for you. Go to the right and hit submit to make sure it gets registered for credit. If you haven't had a chance to answer, please do so now because we do want to get to that one last point, and we're right up against the top of the hour. Uh, I'm going to close this up in about five, four, three, two, one. We'll take a very quick look at the biggest challenges. Uh, it's sort of all over the place. Uh, everyone is a challenge for something. Uh, a little over 10% say lease accounting system is bulletproof, but otherwise a mix of all the others. And Matt, Tim, I'll give it back to you. All right, thank you, Dan. And um, the final point here is use market data to easily estimate the fair market value of real estate. And, and I'm just going to click to the um, to the example on this one because I think it's it's really valuable. Basically, in CoStar, you can take advantage of, of researched real estate data. Um, you can think of it as as real estate comps, and uh, and CoStar uh, researches thousands and thousands of, of properties. Every day, uh, as a as a CoStar customer in Lisa County, you get access to that data for the properties that you occupy. And so, when it comes time to use fair market value information uh, for finance versus operating lease tests, uh, for impairment evaluations, and even uh, when you have business combinations, uh, you have that information at your fingertips, and you don't have to go through a time-consuming process of of going external to your organization to find that data. So something that uh, that can really save a lot of time and, um, and, and is available right there with your, um, with your Lisa County system and CoStar. And, um, and Tim, I know we're, we're right at the end here, but I want to give you the, the final word. The, the moral of the story is this is an area where some organizations struggle and that's determining the fair value of the underlying property. Uh, if they can use information that's readily available to, to, to determine the fair value themselves that will make it a lot easier save them money as they won't have to engage third parties and ultimately save them some time so uh thank you matt for having me join along in today's journey i think this was fun um feel free to reach out with any questions that you may have for matt or myself and hopefully you all found this informative matt back over to you for closing up the session all right. Thank you very much. And, and Dan, um, uh, thank you. And thank you to accounting today. All right. Thank you both. It was a great session. A lot of great information. Uh, everyone in the audience should know we'll be sending you a link to the archive version of it so you can review all the things that Matt and Tim have been talking about because it was a, a tremendous amount of information. You can share it with colleagues and clients. Though, again, if you're not watching it on the 22nd, uh, it doesn't qualify for CPE. But otherwise, thank you all for, for joining us today. We hope to see you at a future webinar.